Well, you all know I'm a, um, my, my church family is Calvary Chapel, so it's always, I feel really, um, I feel like I'm home when I'm at a Calvary. And um, I, I was born in Iran. I'm going to give a quick background, and then I, I feel like the Lord wanted me to, wants me to share from John 15. But um, a lot of you might know this, my story, but I grew up in Iran. Um, um, soon after I was born, there was a revolution, and Iran became an Islamic government. And then there was war with Iraq, and um, the war was in Iran. So I, as a child, I would see the bombs dropped. I would see houses bombed, missiles. I'd walk to school and see um, friends that were missing and their, um, you know, dead bodies in the streets and, and just a lot. And so me and my twin brother um, always prayed. Uh, we always talked to each other. Where is God? Who is God? Why would he allow this? And um, the only God, the only way we knew to know God, I guess, was do we just pray, you know, Muslim prayer, um, you know, five times a day, and uh, you say the same prayer over and over again. We would you would say in Arabic, which the uh, Iranian language is Farsi, so you don't really understand what you're saying. You're just repeating something over and over again. And uh, you know, we tried our best to discover this God, and we we couldn't. Um, because of the war, we ended up moving to the U.S. My brother, um, he, we were seven, eight, and my, uh, um, the government of Iran was signing up little boys to go to war, and uh, these little boys would, um, it could go to war without parents' permission. And if the parents said anything, they would throw the parents in jail, in prison, for saying they were against the government, Iranian government. And so... Um, uh, my brother was really wanting to sign up because they would say, if you die in this war, as a holy war, as jihad, you would go to heaven. And these little boys would run through mines. They would help set off the mines. And then the soldiers would go in. They treated them like cattle in a way, you know. Um, they couldn't train them to fight very much, so they would use them to run through mines, and then the soldiers would go in. And so um, my, that's when my parents, you know, my dad was a very strong Muslim, but that's when he said, you know, he, and they, they couldn't speak out against it. So that's when we moved to the U.S. They were really afraid for his life. Um, within weeks um, um, coming to the U.S., so I, I could say I was a California girl for about a year before I moved to Idaho. Um, <laughs> and kind of like what you said before you moved to Maine. Um, and, and so um, we moved to California, and then my brother... Um, I think a few weeks into it, came running to me and he said, Nagme, Nagme, I, I found the God we've been looking for. His name is Jesus. And he'd had a vision or something, and he said he's God of, God of love. And, and so we asked people, we um, you know, asked around and asked, who's this Jesus that my brother saw? And, and um, some people shared Jesus with us and gave us a Bible. And, of course, my parents found out, and they were very upset. They said, you've been westernized, the secular... California school systems have corrupted your mind into becoming Christians. They, you know, they associated America to Christian, to, you know, Western religion, you know, Western culture. And so they wouldn't believe my brother. They thought the California, this Cal, uh, California school system is what got, made you Christian, not you didn't have a vision. And so my dad was so upset, he, he said, I'd rather move you back to Iran and you die in that war than what has happened to you is this, it's, it's horrible. It's worse than death. And um, that's when we had an uncle who found a job in Boise, Idaho, who said, well, give Idaho a try. It seems somewhere out there. I don't think anyone's heard of it. Boy, I, he found a job <laughs> in <laughs> Boise, Idaho. And so that's how we, and, and he said, you can watch them, that you could, you know, make sure they don't talk to anyone and deep brainwash them back to Islam. And so that was the plan. We moved to Idaho. And about 10 years into our move, uh, my, both my parents gave their heart to Jesus and my younger sister. So. And, you know, and, and my parents really, uh, when we left Iran, closed that door, wanted us to live the American dream and just become successful. We went to college. I, we went, um, I was excited. Uh, still, when I was in high school, my parents hadn't given their heart to Christ. So it was very hard. They, they'd taken our Bible away. They wouldn't let us go to church. My brother and I had to like pray together secretly. They were watching for every, any sign of Christianity. And so when I, I was excited to go to college and rebel and join a church and read the Bible, <laughs> that was 
<laughs> I didn't realize people were looking forward to, go to going to college to party. I was just excited to, you know, my rebellious was following Christ. And so I somehow I followed my brother to one of the most liberal colleges, universities, University of Puget Sound near Seattle. And, and I was, you know, excited. I was, you know, and I, w- I was sharing Christ and I was talking about Christ. And soon I realized um, it's not cool doing that as, as a pre-med major, especially a biology major. And um, it was, I got a lot of, you know, negative feedback. I was shocked because I thought I'd leave my home and I'd be able to have good fellowship with, you know, the American Christians. <laughs> And so, long story short, my brother ended up finish getting his doctorate in quantum physics and, you know, making my parents proud. And I was, as I was about to go to med school, um, the Lord just put on my heart, no, I want you to, um, I have another plan for you. And so, long story short, I ended up going back to Boise. I worked at, at our church office um, for a while, kind of trying to hear from God and went on a few mission trips to India and here and there and you know, um, until in um, September of 2001, the Lord told me, I want you to go to Iran, and I want you to change, I, I want to change the Middle East through my gospel of love. And so I went to uh, the Middle East, I met Said in, two, I went in 2001, so soon after September 11, met Said in um, 2002. Now, um, I'd never dated before. I met Saeed. I was in my mid-20s. Um, he was my first love. He is my first love. And uh, what drew me to him was um, never seen anyone so passionate for Christ, ever. I just never, I don't know how to even explain it. Uh, you'll learn more about our story, but just sold out for Christ. And his conversion story was powerful. He um, was a very strong Muslim, prayed, um, more than the normal Muslim, fasted more. And he was so strong that he was, uh, people, uh, groups like Hezbollah were noticing him and were trying to recruit him to attack Israel. And he um, was actually had heard a Christian pastor say Jesus is Lord and was about to kill that pastor before God intervened and just did a radical conversion in his life. And one night he heard a voice say, Said, I'm coming back. One night he, he, he was... Um, confused if if the uh, Christian belief was true, he'd heard something, and if or the Quran, and he wondered if the Bible is true, then why does Jesus say I'm coming back to and it been two thousand years and he was not back yet? So uh, you know the Muslims, a lot of Muslims believe that the Bible has been changed, so it's not valid anymore, and so that's what he thought, and so he prayed, and what is the true way? And you know at night he heard a voice say, Said, I'm coming back soon, go preach my gospel, and he woke up, and then he heard that voice again. And, um, and he went back to sleep the third time. It was like a loud bomb going off. As he would say it. he woke up shaking and, you know, and sweaty, and he heard, the, uh, he heard a voice say, Said, I'm coming back soon. Go preach my gospel. And as soon as uh, he said, okay, okay, amen, and he saw the back of Jesus walking away. And when I met him, it was right after that. I mean, it was a year after that. He, he converted in the year 2000. Actually, I met him in 2002, and he was... From that night when he had that vision, he was out in the streets preaching the gospel. He was being ridiculed. He was being beaten. He was being, you know, imagine street evangelism in Iran. (laughs) It's not pretty. You know, and and, um, when I met him, that's how he was, just sold out for Christ. And you know how, uh, you know, um, we heard that at the beginning there's some things people do that's cute, you know, you're, you're, you know, your fiance, and then in marriage, it gets kind of old. Said was, you know, you know, when he was, when I met him, he was pastoring around 100, 150 people, under in the house churches, underground churches. And when we got married, I thought this was a show, but I couldn't believe he was praying six, seven hours a day. And after a while, it wasn't cute anymore. It was like, you need to give me some attention. Come on. And. Um, and as I always say, um, when I went to Iran, I was really um, careful to, um, I was really careful not to share the gospel publicly. I was afraid of being arrested, so I was sharing with my cousins and, you know, and, uh, and I, as I always say, soon after I met Said, my arrest record kind of went really high. And... Um, you know, we were, we were uh, arrested in different instances because of um, sharing the gospel. But one of the instances that I remember was 
um, when we had a house church member call us and tell us that, and, and to tell you, from the time I met Saeed, you know, in 2002, there was over 100, you know, people, um, Muslims who had given their hearts to Christ, and he was pastoring them. A lot of them were college age students. By 2005, when we left Iran, because Ahmadinejad became president, and it got really intense, it, to over 2,000 had given their hearts to Christ in 30 cities. So, and, you know, working, working in the Muslim world, it, that's a miracle. One Muslim coming to know Christ is a miracle. And so it's, it's, it was definitely the hand of God, just this movement this, you know, um, that happened was just seeing that. It was like the book of Acts, seeing just the church, the house churches grow and unite in the unity. And, the, and we would, if someone got arrested or something would happen, we'd all pray from midnight till 7 in the morning. And, you know, and so just uh, we lived together you know, as the church. We were just, you know, there was no bubble and one of the arrests was when um, we got a call from one of our house church leaders, and he said, I'm scared. I feel like I'm being followed uh, all day. I feel like something bad is about to happen. Can you come uh, to my house? So we waited till midnight, went to his house, and as soon as we knocked in his house, um, these revolutionary guards, which are considered terrorist groups, they're the most radical um, part, you know, part of the Iranian government guards, they attacked us, threw us in these cars, with guns and took us down these dark alleys and to this interrogation place where there was a courtyard in the middle and there was rooms around. And uh, about two, three hours into it where we were passed around from room to room, we got to this really, um, the head of that place or the boss or he, he had, his, his face was evil. He was big, he had beard, he was really angry at us. And he said, I was sitting here and my husband, or yeah, Saeed, we'd just been married. He was sitting here and the house church leader was sitting there. And he said, if you say you're Muslim, you go free. If you say you're Christian, you will die. And there's guns pointed to our head. And, um, and he looks at me as if I'm supposed to be the first one who says it. And he looks at me as if, this, you should be afraid. He, you know, and he, he looked at me and said, it's not going to be an easy death. You're going to be separated from Saeed. You're going to be in women's prison. You'll be in men's prison. You'll be tortured. You'll be raped. And then you'll die. It's not going to be pretty. And so he's saying this with evil. And, um, and I just I thought about almost 20-some years that I'd been a Christian. And I thought, OK, I've gone to church. I've served the Lord. I've gone mission trips. I came to Iran because of the Lord, but do I really believe him? Do I really believe in Jesus? Because this gun and this person in front of me is real. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, do I really believe? It was that moment of, is Jesus really that real? And having to make that decision. And I felt the Lord say, don't deny me, I will deliver you. And I, so I just opened my mouth, and in the face of fear, I, I felt like the words weren't even going to come out. And I felt, I just opened my mouth and I said, I'm a Christian. And so this guy got angry and he said, your testimony is going to be your witness against you. is like confessing to murder or something. And so I, you know, shared my testimony. He was angry. He said, you've been brainwashed by the West. You're, you know, he was just getting angry and angrier. Heard Saeed's story and he was just out beside himself. How could Saeed, whose mom was teaching at the mosque at that time, how could he... Um, how could he do this? He wasn't in the West. He was, you know, uh, he was born in Iran, raised in Iran, got accepted Christ in Iran. And so for that second, I thought, Lord, you said you're going to deliver me. And here's this guy wanting to, um, you know, kill us. And I felt like he was going to be like Stephen. We were just going to be killed right there. We weren't even going to go to trial. Or, and, um, and as he closed our cases, says, you're done. He, he had the guards take us. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, did I hear right? Are you real? Are you out there? The um, revolutionary guard couldn't shake something, and so he's just, he's struggling. He's like, stop. And he says, I need to talk to you, to say. He takes them to the courtyard. We're sitting back down on this bench. We're seeing into the courtyard. They're talking for half an hour, 45 minutes. They come out, and this big guy, revolutionary guard, is trying so hard not to cry like a baby. He's sniffling, and there's like a tear coming this side, tear coming this side, and he says, just go home, and he rips, I mean, the guards were shocked, he took, took the 
um, folders. He ripped them up, and then he said, um, as we're leaving, he said, can I have a Bible? And so, you know, it was, you know, Saeed was never afraid. <laughs> Saeed was never afraid to um, share the gospel with the hardliners. He said, I know them. I know what they're thinking. They think they're serving God. So that's what I loved about him. He shared with anyone, never really feared. And so here he, he was mm, being threatened by, by, you know, death and, He's sharing the gospel in this guard's heart. You know, the Lord showed me that um, if we hadn't stood up for our faith, that, that guard, that revolutionary guard, might have never known the reality of Jesus. And, you know, when Saeed was recently arrested, the Lord reminded me of that story, and he said, I felt the Lord saying, Saeed's life, because the first week when they took him, we didn't know where he was. And I felt the Lord saying, he's in my hands. His life is in my hands. And... You should have been killed at that, the story I just explained. You should have been killed there, but it was not your time. Don't fear, man. No government, no country, no people have Saeed. I have him. So that gave me a lot of peace. You know, and uh, fast forward, my six minutes is already over. <laughs> like, okay, I think I'm just going to combine the two. Um, but, yeah, I might borrow my phone for some. Um, I, I want to read Saeed's letter as part of the legacy of hope. He wrote a letter to our daughter recently on her eighth birthday. So, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that later. Um, so, you know, long story short, I'm going to explain about our wedding, too. I want to relate it to the legacy. Um, I'll, I'll share it now. I'm just going to combine the two. A lot of things that Saeed did really upset me. Um, like our wedding, but <laughs> I have to explain it too. So I, I'm a very private person. I am scared of, um, I'm, I'm very private. You could never see anything um, before 2012, any posts or anything on Facebook or Twitter from me. You would have to search really hard. Um, Saeed would sometimes take a picture of us and share, we're eating dinner here, and I get so upset at him, like, why do people need to know where we're eating? And, I just felt so embarrassed, and, and I'm a very private person, love Boise, um, I am a homebody, I don't need to see the world, I don't like traveling, uh, deathly afraid of airplanes and talking in front of people, <laughs> and uh, like right before I came, Marie was like praying for me, I'm like, I'm going to have a heart attack right now, <laughs> felt like I was going to have a heart attack, and um, so for the Lord to, uh, fearful, I was really fearful of everything, anxiety, anxious person. The reason I say that is for the Lord to give me so much peace in the worst time of my life and have me do things I would norm normally never do is just a miracle. Um, and he gets all the glory because it's not me. Um, I would rather get an F than speak in front of people in any classes. I'd gladly accept an F. Um, so I want to fast forward. I'll explain about our wedding later because I want to have a focus about legacy. It was all about our wedding was a crusade. That's why I was so mad at him. I felt like we couldn't, I felt like he couldn't just have, and we couldn't just have a normal private wedding. So we went, uh, we went to the Iranian government. Said said, let's go to the Iranian government, say we're Christians and let's have a Christian wedding. And I said, no, you know, I, you know, uh, I felt, I felt as, as a fiancé and then a wife, my first um, role was to argue with them <laughs> and then try to fight as much as I could, and then I, when, I, when I had to, I'd submit. Um, so he won. He won that battle. I was trying really hard not to, but we went to the Iranian government. It was a government before Ahmadinejad. It was uh, his name. The president's name at that time was Khatami. We said, you know, we went to the administration. We said, we're, Christ we're converts. We're Christians. We want a Christian wedding. And Saeed was, you know, he was very adamant about it. He said, I don't want to pray to the God of Allah, and I want to pray in Jesus' name. I want our wedding, you know, under God, you know, Jesus. And so we told them that, and I thought they would get really angry. Like, why would you not want a Muslim wedding? And, and they said, okay. And so we had this church that held about 500, 600 people, and I thought, my mom's going to come from the U.S., my dad, my sister, three maybe my grandma, okay, six, seven from my side, maybe 20, 30 from his side, and then here I, Saeed's printing like 600 
and wedding invitation. And I didn't understand it until the day of. I was just like, you know, oh, you know what? Why are you doing this? Oh, don't worry, honey. And I didn't really get it until the day of our wedding, where it's just the church is pat. He's he's inviting. We're in our twenty, you know, twenties, and he's just like, come to our wedding. It's beautiful. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a party. So all these people are coming to our wedding, and he ha- we had uh, three hundred. So I think Said underestimated too because. He had 300 wedding favors made, beautiful wedding favors with flowers and ribbons, and they were inside of these beautiful favors were Jesus films and Bibles. And so people are wanting these beautiful favors. They're, you know, in this church there's worship, sites up preaching. I'm just in my wedding dress. I'm just looking <laughs> at him. <laughs> and, um, and I was, I was, it's one of those moments where you think back and you're like, why was I so angry? But I was so mad. I was thinking I wanted a small private wedding about one day about me, and he's using it for, to share the gospel. <laughs> and, and there's revolutionary guards circling the church ready to arrest us on our wedding day. And my wedding photographer is like, do you realize what's going to happen? There's revolutionary guards. And my pastor, um, Bob Caldwell from Calvary Boise, he was there. And so I'm like, Shh, I don't want people to know. I don't want him to know that he might get arrested. <laughs> like, just let's keep this quiet. And so I'm stressed out. There's revolutionary guards. He's sharing the gospel. There's like choir. We're in the middle of Tehran in front of the, one of the largest mosques by Tehran University. Worship music's blasted off. People are getting Bibles and Jesus films. And, and so um, I, on our 10th year anniversary, um, just past this year, to, you know, June of this year, 2014, I was smiling because uh, Saeed, we had a big fight on our honeymoon. And, <laughs> on our, and because I was upset, he was doing that. And I said, could you not do ministry for one day? Can, it just, can you just relax one day, no Jesus? Like, I don't know why I said that. But, um, but he would smile at me and say, you know, our 10th year anniversary, I, I'll make it up to you. And so I was flying back from D.C. to Boise. I just heard not really good news about any efforts for Saeed's release. And I just smiled. I I said, you know what? I couldn't have imagined Saeed anywhere else in in the prison for Jesus, sharing about Jesus on our 10th year anniversary. I I could have, you know, he's been, you know, we talk about legacy. Uh, I want to share stories, but he, his whole life was Jesus. His whole life is Jesus. How, he couldn't hold back on our wedding day. He couldn't hold back on anything. And when, it's, when he, even raising our kids, you know, um, he would pray. Um, I would, you know, I, I was working for the first, you know, um, I was working. When we moved to the U.S., I was working a lot, and he was a stay-at-home dad for a while. We, you know, he worked. I stayed. We tried to, you know, make ends meet. And when I was working, I wanted, I wanted to be home, feed the kids dinner, put them to bed, done. But I would, you know, we would have dinner and I'd be cleaning up and Saeed was supposed to be putting the kids to bed. So I, you know, I would finish up. The kids were supposed to be in bed by 7, sleep by 8. I come at 9 or 10 and he's, they're walking around worshiping, praying, (laughs) you know. um, And I would be so upset. Now it's silly that I think about it, but my routine was being ruined. But Saeed was just, the kids saw that. Um, passion, you know, and, and that's, you know, um, we, we, when it talks about, when we talk about legacy and uh, Deuteronomy, where it, um, if I can find it here, where it says, um, in these words, verse 6, which I command you today shall be in your heart. I think once you have it in your heart and you love the Lord and it's just in there, Everything else is easy. You're going to want it all over. It's like Saeed. You want it in your wedding. You want it out in your doorstep. You want it on your, you know, you want it. It's all about when you're in love, when you're that in love with Jesus, it's not a task. If you have to force yourself, I'm going to teach my kids like verses and I have to do this, don't do it. It has to come where you're so, and this is, um, this is what I felt the Lord wanting me to share about John 15. You have to be so connected to the vine. You have to be so in love that it just flows out of you. 
and your kids see that when Saeed was arrested, my kids, I would just pass, I'm like in tears and I'm passing by their room. This four-year-old and five-year-old were holding hands praying and worshiping. I would take videos of them just worshiping Jesus. It was ingrained, Saeed was in putting that in them. Not because he felt that a duty, he just was so in love with Jesus. He was, you know, putting, investing, just, it, it, Jesus is the love of his life. And, um, and in the mornings when I'd go to work, he'd get the kids up and they'd go prayer walking um, in the neighborhood. And there was a lot of Mormon uh, housewives who'd prayer walk with them and he'd share the gospel. <laughs> one, day, one day he was telling me, honey, all these, these ladies want, me to, want to invite me to their tea and I get to share about Jesus. And... and um, it says, you know, you should, uh, where it says you should teach your children when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, just lying down, he would share about Jesus and they would pray. Waking up, they do prayer walks. I get mad at them. What, why, what, a two-year, an eight-year-old and a three-year-old prayer walking for hours in the neighborhood? Come on, like, this is too much. And so, but he's so in love with Jesus, you know, that, that, um, that just, that, that's, he, he would just give, you know, the kids saw that, the kids saw that, you know, and I was a lot about structure and clean house, and, and Saeed was all about let it be messy, let's just get the kids to, um, you know, know Jesus, and so when, when our churches grew to a few thousand, we left Iran, um, we went back in 2009, and the government at that time was Ahmadinejad. They took Saeed, and they said, we know you're not doing house church anymore. Because when we left Iran, the house churches, they, we, they didn't have a pastor. They kind of went their separate ways. And it was hard pastoring them from afar. Um, so after about a year, it was just kind of... So in 2009, when we went back to Iran, the government said, well, you're not doing house church anymore. Why don't you? And Saeed said, well, I'm a Christian. I want to help the people of Iran. They said, why don't you do humanitarian efforts? So that's when we started the orphanage. That's what Saeed had been traveling back and forth to. But one of the things, I mean, just beautiful lessons he would teach our kids, and I, again, I would be upset by it, is uh, right before he'd go to Iran, he'd open up his suitcase and say, bring me toys and clothes for these orphans. And so my kids would just, our kids would bring these toys and clothes and like old clothes and old toys, and he'd say, no, nope, give me your favorite. And I'd be like, what? We weren't doing very well financially. Like, just, I'd be like, no, <laughs> no, not that toy that, you know, they got on Christmas. Or, But he would say, you know, you have to give God your best. And so that was painful for me as a mom to watch. Like, you know, you get attached to your kids' toys and clothes too. <laughs> so, you know, you're like, and so, but I, now I look at it. It was just like hard lessons, but he put it. Right now, I mean, our kids, I love it. I mean, they're one of the most giving people. They don't, they're not attached to any material things. You know, they're just, uh, Rebecca will see a child and she'll just give her best toy. And, but he ingrained that in them and he really, you know, um, put that, um, you know, really, um, but the thing is he didn't see it as a task. He was so, he's so in love with Jesus that it was just flowed out naturally. And um, so he was traveling back and forth, working on the orphanage. In 2012, um, he went in June of 2012. He, you know, did the normal nightly routine with our kids and um, took him, uh, woke up at 5 to, to take Saeed to the airport. He kissed our kids goodbye and um, said a quick goodbye. I'll say, I said he, was, he left in June. He was supposed to come back in July. So I'll see you in a few weeks. And that was the last time I saw him. And um, I don't know, maybe if I knew, you know, I'd never see him again or I wouldn't see him all these years, I would, I would have done something, not let him go. I don't know. I had no idea. Um, and he called me in July. He was supposed to come to the airport. He called me. He said, they're not letting me leave the country. I don't know what's going on. Um, pray. So we were praying. That he kept calling passport control, and he kept calling um, the intelligence officer, and they said, we're just going to ask you some questions. So on September 26, 
he was supposed to get a call and they were supposed to a ask him some questions. He was supposed to go show up somewhere, be interrogated or questioned, and then he was supposed to come home. And instead, um, he, five revolu I got a call. So Saeed's in Iran with his parents. I'm in Boise. I get a call from his mom. As you said, one of the worst things you could ever imagine is seeing your child in chains. I get a call from his mom. Five Revolutionary Guards attacked the house he was staying out with his parents, took him, and um, she was crying hysterically. She said, I don't know where they've taken him. I don't know if he's alive. The way they took him was just horrible, horrific. One of, um, they just told him, you can grab a few. On, you know, His mom knew it was going to be it was not just a few hours. It was something, something was going to happen because they had him take some under underclothes, undergarments, and they, you know, they just raided the house, took computers and stuff. And she was crying. And the, for the first week, we didn't know where he was. We didn't even know if he was alive. And then, as you know, the story, we realized he was in Evan Prison, one of the worst prisons in the world. Uh, he was tortured, beaten. He was told if he say if he. Um, says he's a Muslim, he'll go free, be able to join the kids and I, and, if, and he wouldn't deny his faith. And you know, I tell the kids, I said, you should be proud of daddy. And um, he stood up for his faith. He led so many people, there's reports of you know, over 30. He led so many people to Christ in the first prison. They moved him to an exile prison. <laughs> and they moved him to the murder ward, and Saeed, the head of that prison told the, the head of the exile prison, which was the worst, worst prison than the other one, which we couldn't even imagine, told Saeed that, that if, um, if he tries to evangelize here, they will kill him. Because they put him in the murder ward where like hardcore prisoners, rapists, and murderers were on death row. They said if he, they realize he's a convert, they will kill him. Better yet, if he tries to say anything. And just by Lord's mercy, uh, people were, were led to Christ there, and Saeed didn't die. <laughs> and so they moved him to the political ward, you know, and again, uh, you know, I heard through the grapevine, actually through our, um, yeah, I know, that, that the Iranians are frustrated with him because he keeps sharing the gospel. And I said, well, kick him out. <laughs> um, so he was doing so badly. They, he, um, in the murder ward, uh, he had lice, and he was just physically doing horribly. They, um, in March of this year, they finally took him, hospitalized him. And in May, he was recovering slowly. They wouldn't give him the surgeries he needs because of internal injuries and bleeding. In May, um, because people were being led to Christ in the hospital, <laughs> they beat him again. They beat him really badly and took him to the prison. So he's been moved around quite a bit, quite a number of times. But you know, as I've shared, as um, I've, sh I've shared with our government, it's him sharing Christ is not an act of defiance; it's an act of love. He can't imagine. You know, one of the prisoners uh, wrote his wife, and I got to see part of that letter. He said, I don't feel like I'm in prison anymore. I feel set free. And he had a 10-year sentence and because of Jesus. And his wife actually ended up over the phone calling me and gave her heart to Christ. And, and so Saeed sees, he sees these prisoners needing Jesus. And so he gives, he's not trying to be defiant. He's just trying to give what he has, what he found. He was depressed Muslim who didn't have joy and peace, and in Christ, he found it. He's, um, he found this connection with God. And when I heard um, about Saeed's arrest, you know, I'm already, you know, um, I was already a very fearful person of what, what if this happened to my husband? What if something happened to my kids? What if about finances, about anything you can think of, I was always afraid. I, and when Saeed was taken, um, I felt um, my whole world just turn upside down. I didn't. I was. I became a single mom. It hurt to even watch my kids. My kids wanted to watch movies of him, like home videos of him and pictures to remember him because they'd forgotten. My daughter was just crying hysterically, and she's like, "Mommy, I'm forgetting Daddy's voice." 
And so I, I was just in tears watching them watch home videos. And they flipped through their, um, the last few years, they flipped through their album so much that it's ripped to pieces. I haven't had a chance. I did album for the first two, three years of their life. The last five years, it's nothing. <laughs> so, but you know, um, so they'll just be like, Mom, can you tell this story of when he would take us to the park or tell this? And for me, it's painful. So I guess I became a single mom, ha, saw, I've seen my kids suffer, really miss their dad. And um, I didn't know what our future would look like. You know, I didn't know where, you know, we lived with my parents, but I didn't, I, I honestly didn't know. And um, I reached out to God. So, and this is where John 15 comes. I felt like for the first time, I abided in the vine. I reached out to God and I said, God, you have to help me. I can't fall into this hole. I felt such, so anxious. I don't know if you, I don't know. This dark place of anxiety and depression was so dark. My mom was crying on my feet and she was saying, how can I help you? And I realized she can't help me. No human being can help me right now. And, you know, I would pick up the phone to talk to my best friend and Saeed couldn't answer the phone. I couldn't talk to him. I felt like, oh, this is how it is to lose this someone. I couldn't talk to him. He, I, you know, I, I could process anything with him. And there I was, kept dialing his number like a mad person. I, it took me a week to really just realize, why are you even trying to call him? He's not going to answer. And so my, and I realized no one can help me except God who made me. And so I, I was desperate. I said, Lord, I can't, I can't, um, I don't have an option to lose it because I am a single mom and my husband needs me. I can't just, I can't just go in a hole and, and just sleep this and wake up and for it to be over. I, I have to, I have to function. And for the first time, I felt connected to the vine, and I feel like this is what the Lord's telling, wanting me to share with you. You know, what he's saying is, says, I'm the vine, and my father is the vine dresser in, in John 15. And then he, um, abide in me. So it's talking about um, every branch in me. So it's talking about branches in him. So it's talking about Christians. But then... A lot of, you know, we, we might be in Jesus, but are we abiding in him? For the first time in my life, I felt like I was abiding. I needed to abide. If I didn't abide, I couldn't function. And I clung to him, and I, I just felt connected. And I felt this peace of God wash over me. And, you know, um, but I had my flesh, which for 30 years of my life, of my Christian walk, I trusted, I had my flesh rebelling against me. I don't know how to explain it, but you know, um, it, throughout our marriage, everything that I felt, everything that I thought, I said it, like the hormones, like once a month, Said and I have, would, have, would have a huge fight, and I wouldn't know why <laughs> until years later. I'm like, why are we having a fight every like three weeks, like something big, like an explosion? <laughs> it took me like a long time to figure out what was happening. So with the hormones, with everything, but I realized my flesh, you know, the, the Bible says my heart is evil. That's not, you don't want to hear that. It says our thoughts are to be kept captive. But for so long, I let it lead me. I let it lead me to destructive relationships with my husband, with people, if I got hurt. And the flesh, you know, the way you recognize it, and that's the first part, um, is you have to recognize your flesh. If it's all about you, your rights, Poor you, you need you, it's all about you, it's your flesh. It's your flesh acting out. And this, you know, we, are, we learn in this culture, if walk away from that relationship that's hurting you. Walk away from this job, walk away from this church. If it's, it needs to be about you, it's about making you happy. That's against the gospel message. You know, I, one day I was praying and I could see masses going to the cross and getting saved. And, um, and the Lord just put on my heart, and I could see people getting, kneeling down, getting saved, and then standing up and walking away. And I felt the Lord say, my people have forgotten that they have to carry their cross. They're leaving it behind. And I, I felt, um, you know, for me, I, I would always hear how to live a victorious Christian life. 
and I never knew how, but the Lord just slowly starts speaking to me is the first part when you connect, when you abide, is to get rid of yourself so you can, God can work through you. And it's a daily death. Every day you wake up and it wants to be about you. You have to win that argument. You have to get your rights. You have to, it has to be, uh, your flesh wants to fight and win. And it's, you know, and so you have to beat it down every day. And you have to, um, you know, as John 15 says, you know, um, it gives you the next step. Once you beat down your flesh, which is all about you, which is selfish in your marriage and with your kids, with your community, and if it's, if it's selfish, then it's the flesh, and it needs to die. And it's going to be a painful death. A lot of times your flesh wants to speak. Uh, someone says something against you and you want to fight back. And not saying anything makes you, you feel like you're going to have a heart attack because it's your flesh wanting to come out. You're like, oh, it has to come out. And you know, finally I got where Paul says, I die to myself that you may live. Because when we let out the flesh, we're killing those around us. We're killing our family. But when we die to ourselves and swallow that, and our heart's beating fast, and I have to take hot baths, coffee, whatever, argue with myself, the only time I calm down of not wanting to fight back and to tell them what it is, you know, how it is, and our, you know, is, is when the Lord just speaks to me and says, you have no right. You have no right. You know, go and love. And, and so I guess... Um, you know, in John 15, it says, um, as the, as the, in 9, verse 9, as the Father loves me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. So God is saying, you're saying, how do I abide in God and, and Jesus? Yes, well, you abide in his love. Well, how do you abide in his love? He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And how, what commandment do you keep? It's pretty easy, you know, it's, there's a lot of rules and you should do this and you should do that. But really when you boil it down, it goes, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. So saying, obey me, love each other, you know, just love one another. Why are we, as Christians, we should be, we should be, we have the power you know, other religions don't have the power to love and forgive. We have it because it comes from on high. We can go to the presence of God and come back and wash the feet of our enemy. I don't want you going washing the feet of those Muslim radicals right now. I want you to wash the feet of your husband, to wash the feet of your children, to wash the feet of the person next to you. Um, you know, my, my son loves Karate Kid and he likes, he likes uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Don't ask me how he got into it because my mom's been taking care of my kids. So, you know, <laughs> they, you know they've been getting into things. And um, so I, I decided to watch Karate Kid and sign him up for karate and Taekwondo. So he's taking classes. And so I was watching karate with him. And, and as, as, as I was watching, God really spoke to me through that movie. You know, this really scrawny looking kid goes to be, gets beaten up by these, you know, tough guys who are karate masters. And this kid wants to um, become a, you know, uh, get, become a master, become really good at karate and beat, beat up these kids at this tournament that's at the end of the movie. Well, he goes to this um, karate master. And what does the karate master tell him to do? Wax on, wax off. <laughs> Things that you don't even think it's related to karate. And then at the end, the child is really frustrated and says, I'm done. Like, why are you teaching me these? This is not related. And then at the end, you get it. Like, all the moves were related to karate moves that make him win the tournament. And the Lord showed me. A lot of times, we, we take our daily lives in vain. The wax on, wax off, daily death to self. The people the Lord has placed in your life to help you to die to yourself, to help, you know, Every marriage, you might think my marriage is the hardest. Every marriage is hard because there's two fallen natures going at each other. <laughs> you know, it's two fallen natures. You get offended when they do that, when they fold the wrong way, they talk the wrong way, they say the wrong thing. You know, um, and, you know, you're frustrated because your husband's not as spiritual as you think he should be. Or There's just this two fallen natures that want the other person changed, and there's always going to be sharpening brothers you know you're going to be sharpened in, in a relationship and i think even as a single person it's hard 
you know, um, of, of what is my future, requires intimacy with God of where does my future look like, who am I going to, you know, who am I going to marry, am I going to ever get married, and things like that. But in, in um, those everyday things where you have to die to yourself, don't take it in vain. It's the exact move the Lord is teaching you, the death to self, daily death to self, is what's required for you to be a disciple. And what's a disciple? A disciple is a world changer. There's no middle ground. You're either the light and the salt, and the world comes to you. You know, when, we, when I was in Iran, there was war. There would be one candle. We'd turn off all the lights because we didn't want the Iraqi airplanes to see the houses. So all the lights would be out, and they'd be a candle. And guess where everyone goes? They go to that candle. And so you, there's, once you walk with Christ, you have to die to yourself and let him shine. The only way to let him shine is to get rid of yourself and die to yourself daily. Die to your selfish desires daily. And, and then the world comes to you. And, I, and I'm going to quickly, I mean, I've spoken, as Marie said, I've spoken before the United Nations, over 100, 100, 120 countries, ambassadors, and I got to share Jesus as they heard in their own language. I got to tell them that Jesus is the solution to what you're looking. This is 100 countries, not, this is 100 ambassadors. And, and I've been able to share about Jesus, that he is the way. He's the solution to what you're, you're spending billions of dollars gathering all these countries. Let's solve this problem. It's really Jesus. And I, I was able to share that as they heard in their earpieces in their own language. I was before the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy, very liberal human rights group, and I got to share about Jesus. You know, that Saeed's in this prison because of Jesus Christ, because he believes Jesus Christ came to this earth, paid the price, and he's risen again. Whoever believes in him has life. And I got to share that in front of a very liberal human rights group that gives, you know, very prestigious um, human rights awards from people all over the world. I was the only Christian. I've spoken before the European Parliament. We prayed in, in the European Parliament with one of, the, one of the vice presidents of the Parliament. And one of my lawyers said, I don't think this has ever happened in the European Parliament. Um, I've spoken before our Congress a couple times. I've spoken before. Uh, one of my greatest um, memories is I, I recently got, I don't remember, this year sometime, I was in front of the Dutch Parliament, the you know, Netherlands, and there was the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, all these parties. And I got to, it was right before Easter, so it was spring of, you know, this year. And I got to share about Jesus, and they were emotional. I couldn't believe it. This Communist Party and the Socialist Party, and I got to share about how Jesus is forgiving. Saeed can hug his enemies because of Jesus Christ. He can love his enemies because of Jesus Christ. So, and I've been able to share in front of, you know, over 50 million Iranians in secular, like, news channels, BBC, Farsi, VOA, Persia. I've been able to share, you know, I had a lawyer on live, not live TV on news channels. An Iranian lawyer was arguing, was saying, you, we Iranians need to protect our culture, and we can't let these people from the West come and make us Christians and take away our, our you know, heritage, Muslim heritage. And I got to say, you know what, our heritage is... is actually 600 years before Islam was Christianity. And I got to say, you know, we were the first to worship Jesus at his birth. We were the first, you know. I got to say that live on very secular news channels that broadcast into Iran. And my father-in-law at that time was in Iran. He said, he called me, he's like, this whole neighborhood is saying they're, they've watched you and they say, we didn't know you could become Christian. Oh, and then at the end, when I said that, like before Islam, we, there was Christianity in our nation, in Iran. Um, King Cyrus, the history of Iran, King Darius, and all of that, I got to share. And I said, we're not losing our culture. We're going back to our culture. And, um, and you know, it's interesting because um, it was, there was a lawyer there that ha had uh, fought for the hikers. So it was like different lawyers that had... had represented Americans who were in prison in Iran. And uh, one of the lawyers, uh, the host asked one of the lawyers, said, is it e illegal to become a Christian in Iran? And the Muslim lawyer who was saying, you know, we should protect our culture said, no, because it's not. In Iran, it's not illegal to become a Christian. And so my father-in-law was calling me from Iran. He's like, people are asking me. We didn't know it was not illegal to become Christian. <laughs> I was like, yes, you know. So, I mean, the Lord has given me a platform in places I never experienced, um, in very secular 
um, secular environments, places where people would never ask a Christian to come and speak. And I've been able to share um, in private, uh, in crowds, but also in private with ambassadors, with government officials. Um, you know, I, I, there's so many testimonies of government officials I've shared Christ with. And, and so, um, um, and so, I mean, we, I've, I've been on Fox and CNN here, and every time I've met with a reporter, been able to share Christ. And, and so it's just been, it's been an amazing open door for the gospel. And so for me, I feel like Saeed's in prison. Um, they're trying to silence him for the gospel, and so I feel like I'm going to speak out. <laughs> and, you know, um, People ask me, um, people ask me what would Saeed say and what would the persecuted church say, and I say, they would say, carry on the torch. You know, we're imprisoned, we're tortured, we're killed because the gospel is trying to be silenced, and they would say, use your freedom for the gospel. Don't, don't be shy. Speak out, talk about Jesus. You know, live out Christ, live out Christ. And so I want to um, encourage you I felt um, Vanessa, Vanessa was saying she was praying. She felt the Lord talking to her about marriage, and I just feel the same way. I feel like our marriages are under attack. Um, as as the body of Christ, we should we should be the number one example of, a, of of not just the marriage. Either most marriages either fall apart, or you're together and you're miserable. <laughs> but a marriage that's beautiful, that's representation of Christ in the church, that's there's just there's people look at it and they want it and they they want the world doesn't have that and so I encourage you is um, I encourage you to just you know uh, learn that process of Jesus says if you want to be my disciple die to yourself die to that flesh that's deceiving you that's taking you down a long path of destruction and then fall carry the cross you know when, as a Muslim you don't understand Muslims don't understand why Christians wear the cross as a sign of death. For us, it's a sign of life. And so the same way as Christians, we see carrying our cross as a sign of death. But really, that's where you find life. That's where you're going to find life in your families, in your community, in our country. And more than ever, our country needs that. So I'm going to finish with reading, um, if I can have my phone. I'm going to read this letter Saeed recently wrote. And I think it's a beautiful representation of... Um, thank you. I think it's a beautiful representation of uh, legacy. Said has written a lot of um, letters from prison, and this one he recently wrote. My daughter, last time she saw her dad, he was five, she was five, her fifth birthday, and then um, she's, she turned eight recently, and so he'd written her a letter. He says, my dearest Rebecca Grace, happy eighth birthday. You're growing so fast and becoming more beautiful every day. I praise God for his faithfulness, faithfulness to me every day as I watch from a distance through the prison walls and see pictures and hear stories of how you're growing both spiritually and physically. Oh, how, how I long to see you. I know that you have questions, that you, you have questions why you have prayed so many times for my return and yet I'm not home yet. Now there's a big why in your mind. You're asking why Jesus isn't answering your prayers and the prayers of all the people around the world praying for my release and for me to be home with you and our family. The answer to the, to the why is who. Who is in control? Jesus Christ is in control. I desire, this is the legacy part, I desire for you to learn important lessons during, during these trying times, lessons that you carry now and for the rest of your life. The answer to the why is who. The confusion of why has all of this happened and why your prayers are not answered yet is resolved with understanding who is in control. Lord Jesus Christ, our God. God is in control of the whole world and everything that is happening in it is for his good purpose, for his glory, and will be worked out for our good. Romans 8, 28. Jesus allows me to be kept here for his glory. He's doing something inside each of us and also outside in the world. People die and suffer for their Christian faith all over the world, and some might wonder why. But you should know the answer of why is who. It is for Jesus. He is worth the price. He has a plan to be glorified through our lives. I want you to read the book of Habakkuk. He had the same question as you. 
but see that the Lord answered him in Habakkuk 2.3. The vision comes and doesn't delay on time. Wait for it. Mommy and I always had big desires to serve Jesus. So this is the uh, uh, prayer that is dangerous. We wanted God. You said you wanted your son changed, and you didn't expect it would happen in the prison, and we never expected this was how God was going to use us. Um, Mommy and I always had big desires to serve Jesus and had great visions to be used for his kingdom and his first glory. So today we pay a cost because God who created us called us to that. And so I want you to know that the answer to all of your prayers is that God is in control. He knows better than us what is he is doing in our lives and all around the world. Therefore, declare as Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did in Daniel 3, 17 through 18. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fi burning fiery furnace, fiery furnace. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we, will, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the image, the gold image which you've set, set up. You know, Saeed won't bow down to any other god than Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how, what you know, he goes through. And uh, Saeed says, And learn and declare, as Habakkuk did, that even if we do not get the results that we're looking for, God is still in control, and we will praise his holy name. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, there be no um, herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make my, me walk on high heels. Then, my dear beloved daughter, Rebecca Grace, I pray God will bring me back home soon. But if not, we will sing together as Habakkuk did. Hallelujah. Either separated by prison walls or together at home. So let Daddy hear you sing a loud hallelujah that I can hear all the way here in the prison. I'm so proud of you, my sweet, courageous daughter. Glory to God forever. Wow, I always cry in that part. <laughs> um, You know, I just encourage you to, um, I think living a legacy, re really, your, our kids watch us. I, I noticed when Saeed was taken that my kids had watched him. And his passion for Christ consumed them. You know, they read Bible stories. Um, when we were in Washington, D.C., doing a prayer vigil in front of the White House, and uh, one of the ACLJ lawyers you know, took my kids to the Smithsonian, and she said, she came, she said, we were watching this, um, this uh, shark eat this dolphin, and Jacob, there, you know, it's like a little room where everyone's watching, Jacob said, why did, he screamed out, he's like, why did Adam and Eve have to sin? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, that's interesting that he would say that, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's when we live for Christ, when we're, we're consumed by him. It's, it's not that hard to pass on a legacy. You know, it's, it's not, when you connect to the vine, it's not that hard to bear fruit. If, once you get rid of yourself, then this, when God works, he's beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. And um, one thing I love about Jesus, I come from, you know, Islam. Islam was always by force you know, always take, took lands and uh, forced people to believe. And Jesus always ran away from crowds, you know. I mean, he would serve them, but he never forced anyone. He's, he's so amazing that he doesn't have to be forced on anyone. So when we live him, when we live him, he, people want it. Evangelism is not hard. Fruit is not hard. I've had to run away from people who want to know about Jesus because I've been busy. I was at the Geneva, um, at the UN, and there was human rights groups, Iranian people, um, human rights advocates that kept coming after me and saying, you know, I don't think I'm a Muslim anymore. I think I'm agnostic. Um, but I, but I, we've heard testimonies from the prison about your husband, people that have been freed, and we want to know about this Jesus. He seems to be God of love. And so, you know, people, that people, 
people have come to me, atheists, you know, Muslims, it doesn't matter. They said there's something about this Jesus that you're, you know, your husband's willing to pay a price and you have so much um, peace because it's, it's not possible. And so I think when we connect to the vine and we can get rid of our selfish ways and self, self, selfishness and say, Lord, if you died on the cross, I can die to my flesh today and give life to my family. I can get over myself. I can get over poor me. I need to be treated. I need this. I need that. And I can pour life into my family and I can pour life into my community. And, and then the world will see the beauty of Jesus when you get rid of yourself and allow him to shine. And, and before the world sees it, your family's going to see it and you're going to leave a legacy that way. It's just, it's, it's easy. It's just, you connect to him. If, so I want to invite you, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ, um, you know, I, I want to invite you to accept him as your Lord and Savior and find this amazing life that no matter what's happening in your life, there might be storms and rain and waves and whatever, you can be at peace. You can be okay. You can have peace and joy in the worst time of your life because you have this connection with the God who made you who makes you okay, who takes away all the fears, all anxiety. He makes you okay. He's the only one who can do that. So if you don't know him, I want you, I invite you to accept him. And if you do know him, I, I, I ask you to step from that, from being in the vine to abiding in him. I, I invite you to go in his presence and enjoy him and cherish him and just be filled. You know, you don't have to be forced to read the Bible. For me, I long. I can't, I was telling Marie, I was, I can't even face people if I haven't faced Jesus first. I, I honestly, I can't. I wake up in the morning. My husband's not there. I'm in a hotel. I'm alone. My kids are separate from me. I haven't seen my kids in two years either. I've been, you know, going nonstop, trying everything. And, you know, I can't imagine my husband being in, in prison one more day. And then, um, so it's, I wake up to this new life that I don't necessarily like. And I have to die to myself, and I, I, you know, and God just every day His grace is sufficient for me, and so every day is is just um, I have to hear His word, I have to go in His presence before I can even have the strength to get up. And so, you know, the trials of your life, if you, I know all of us have it. It's okay. It's just make uh, forcing you into this intimacy with Christ where you can't get up unless you. He gives you the strength. And if you're there, it's okay. If you're going through a lot of relationship drama, you know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 10, he says, you know, he has a thorn in his side. He wants it removed. You know, I, when Saeed was arrested, I wanted this thorn removed. Like, just take it, Lord. And in uh, verse 10, it says, um, Paul, you know, and God says, my grace is sufficient. Verse 10, Paul says, I, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproach, in need, in persecution, in distress. Who takes pleasure in need, in distress, when your life is in chaos and distress and upside down? But Paul takes the, uh, pleasure because he's learned to this, in the midst of all this, it's an opportunity to discover your weakness and discover the strength of Christ and see Christ work through your life. And so I, I encourage you, just allow, embrace the suffering, allow it to take you to Jesus, abide in him, Take time to abide in him. And, you know, everything else the Lord just does. He's looking. He's allowing situations in your life because he's looking for that intimacy. He wants you. He's jealous. He's jealous for you. And so someone might be breaking, someone who you've thought is, this is, you know, someone who you, you looked up to maybe broke your, has broken your heart or something or a, a situation. But God's like, take your eyes off of that. Look at me. I'm, you, he's allowed you to be heartbroken over that situation. So um, he wants you. He's, you know, he's in love with you. He wants all of your attention. He's jealous for you. And I just encourage you to abide in him today. And